The state of New Hampshire is probably one of the last states you would associate with crime. With its beautiful scenic views of the landscape and wildlife, one would hardly think that crimes from the pits of hell could take place in the granite state. Today, the citizens of New Hampshire know differently. They know all too well. For their sense of security in this idyllic land was shattered beginning in 1978. After that point in time, things would never be the same. The Connecticut River Valley sits between New Hampshire and Vermont, and women began to get murdered from 1978 to 1987 in this location. Was this the work of a serial killer or several killers who all happened to be in the area around the same time? Let's explore what occurred and you can come to your own conclusions about what actually happened back then. October 24, 1978, the first victim, 27-year-old Kathy Vaughn Alexander Millican was found dead with 29 stab wounds. She had been at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve photographing birds and her body was found yards away from where she was last seen. Three years later, July 25, 1981, Mary Elizabeth Prightly, who was 37 years of age, went missing while hitchhiking near Interstate 91 at the Massachusetts Vermont border. The last known sighting of her was near exit 13 on the Massachusetts Turnpike in Framingham, Massachusetts. She had been dropped off by a friend and was trying to make her way to Waterbury, Vermont, where she lived with a friend. Murray was a student at the University of Vermont at the time. Her body was found 15 days later on August 9th in the woods off of Unity Stage Road in Unity, New Hampshire. Her cause of death was undetermined because of the condition of the body, but the circumstances surrounding her disappearance and death are suspicious. The next victim, 17-year-old Bernice Courtmarch, was last seen alive around 3.30 p.m., May 30th, 1984. Bernice was a nurse's aide. She was reported missing the next day. It was believed that she was hitchhiking to her boyfriend's home in Newport before she vanished. It was assumed that she was traveling along Route 12. Her skeletal remains were found nearly two years later on April 19, 1986, just off Cat Hole Hill Road in Newport, New Hampshire. She had been stabbed to death. Now this is where the pattern changes from the first three victims. Unlike them, this next victim, Ellen Fried, was not isolated and she spoke to someone which could have possibly given some clues as to what happened to her. When she went missing, the authorities had a site they could check for evidence. Maybe someone saw something at a particular time or something to that effect. July 20th, 1984, Ellen Fried, age 26, who was a nurse, was last seen talking on a payphone outside of a convenience store in Claremont. She had stopped after leaving work at the Valley Regional Hospital to make a phone call to her sister. She told her sister that a strange car kept driving back and forth by the grocery store, Leo's Market, where she was using the phone. This was the last conversation she would have with her sister. The next day, she didn't show up at work and was reported as a missing person. Her car was found later that day on Jarvis Road, only a few miles from the grocery store. Her skeletal remains were found in a wooded area next to the Sugar River in the Kellyville area of Newport, New Hampshire on September 19, 1985. Her cause of death was undetermined because of the skeletal remains that were found. The circumstances of her disappearance and the findings at the scene were consistent with Ellen having been sexually assaulted before her death. The fifth young woman, 27-year-old Eva Morris, was hitchhiking on the morning of July 10, 1985 on Route 12 in North Charleston, New Hampshire, when she went missing. By now, there is a distinct pattern of the disappearances. Another woman's body was found this time Eva's remains were discovered April 25th, 1986, in Unity, New Hampshire, only 500 feet from where Mary Quietly's remains had been discovered. She had been stabbed to death also. 
At this point, we know that the evidence points to death by stabbing in all of the cases. Subsequently, a sketch of a man seen in the area was created. It appears to be a white man wearing glasses with short hair. So now the authorities were at the point where they had a suspect's description. Though a description was good to have, it led to no arrests. New Hampshire was still a playing field for some unknown killer to continue killing women as they pleased. The next murder was completely different than the previous killings. May 15, 1986, 36-year-old Linda Moore, wife and mother of two, was found dead in her home. She had been doing yard work and lived only a short distance from I-19. Her husband found her after he arrived home from work. She had been stabbed more than 20 times. It had been a particularly savage attack. This was out of the norm when considering the other murder victims. Linda was the only victim to have been killed at home. Was the killer getting more daring and psychotic? The news of Linda's death spread quickly through town and people began worriedly locking their doors and keeping a closer eye on their children. This slang made them pay more attention to what was actually happening around them. They followed the news reports more closely. They had something to worry about now. A local resident told the news that everyone was scared and that they wished the cops would tell them something. They locked their doors for the first time in years and their kids were scared. They wished that the police would tell the residents and neighbors something about the murder and whether it was a wild maniac or someone who knew Linda Moore. The police didn't know who they were looking for. All they had to go by was the composite sketch of the clean-shaven white male with a round face, dark rimmed glasses, and dark trimmed hair. The man was thought to be 20 to 25 years old, slightly stocky and carrying a bright blue knapsack on the day of the murder. He was said to have been spotted near Linda's home on the day of the murder and may have been hitchhiking. The same description came from more than one source. Now the region was beginning to realize that this murder may be connected to a series of killings along the Connecticut River in both Vermont and New Hampshire. It was then that the killings became known as the Connecticut River Valley Murders. January 10, 1987, 39-year-old Barbara Agnew, another nurse, was returning from a ski trip in Stratton, Vermont when she went missing. That evening, her green BMW was found by a road worker abandoned at the northbound I-19 rest stop in Hartford, Vermont, just 10 miles from her house, her home. The driver's door was cracked open. There was blood on the steering wheel. This evidence inside the vehicle gave state police concerns for her well-being. It turns out that their concerns were warranted. Her body was found three months later, March 28, 1987, near an apple tree in Hartford. She was still wearing her ski bibs, which held her lift ticket. The snow surrounding her body was still black with blood. Her body had been originally identified by her sister by the jewelry Barbara had been wearing. This next incident led to a break in the case. On August 6, 1988, 21-year-old Jane Borowski, who was seven months pregnant at the time, was attacked. She had spent the evening at a county fair in Keene, New Hampshire, where friends had helped her win some stuffed animals for her baby. On her way home, she decided to stop to get a drink from a vending machine beside a grocery store in Winchester, New Hampshire. Once she got the soda, she returned to her car and started to drink it. A man appeared next to Jane's window and asked her whether the payphone worked. With no warning, he then grabbed her. A struggle ensued. As he attacked her, he said something to her about how she beat up his girlfriend. Jane denied this. Then he asked if her car was from Massachusetts. She denied this as well, saying that she had New Hampshire plates. She ran the first chance she got, but the attacker caught up to her and stabbed the pregnant woman 27 times. He left her for dead and drove off. After he was gone, she was able to crawl back to her car and drive over two miles on Route 32 to a friend's house for help. 
In a surprising coincidence, before arriving at her friend's, she realized that the car in front of her was her attacker. When she pulled into her friend's house, her attacker paused for a moment, then made a U-turn and drove past slowly before finally leaving as her friends started assisting her. She received medical attention and found out that she suffered from a severed jugular, two collapsed lungs, a kidney laceration, and severed tendons in her knees and thumb. She and her baby miraculously survived. The brutal attack left her daughter with a mild case of cerebral palsy, some problems with speech, learning, and motor skills. Thankfully, being that she was the only woman known who survived these attacks, she was able to give a description of the maniac and the first few characters of his license plate. A composite sketch of her attacker was created. The police were out of leads and decided to call in criminal psychologist John Philpin to try and create a profile of the killer. John made several trips to the locations where Bernice and Ellen's bodies were found to try to get into the killer's mindset. He believed that the killer pre-selected his sites and took the victims there as a way to frighten them even more before eventually killing them. He got with Jane to help solve the case. Jane agreed to go under hypnosis to help remember more details. John asked her to describe the attack in detail. The details that stuck out to John were that Jane remembered that her attacker seemed calm and collected. She also said that as soon as she stopped struggling, he seemed to lose interest and quit stabbing her. She thought his vehicle to be a 75 to 85 Jeep Wagoneer with wood panels. The number she remembered from his license plate was 662. The police ran the plates and came up with 350 possible matches. In 1991, an Idaho police officer saw a composite of the Connecticut River serial killer and re recognized him as someone who had previously been held in their prison. He called in the tip and reported the information, but it's unknown if anything came from this. Three other murders from that time period may or may not have been connected. The case has gone cold because the killer stopped murdering women in the area after Jane fought him and survived. This must have scared him. In a case like this, it's hard to find out who the serial killer actually is. Making the case even more complex is the fact that the states of New Hampshire and Vermont are two of the states in the U.S. that borders Canada, so there could be an international killer on the loose. Currently, the authorities have narrowed it down to three suspects. The first suspect, Michael Nicolau, came to the attention of the police after a Florida murder-suicide on New Year's Eve 2005. Michael shot his estranged wife and stepdaughter before turning the gun on himself. This caught the attention of Lynn Marie Cardi, a detective who had been hired by a Vermont mother to find her daughter, Michelle Ashley, who had two babies with Michael and disappeared in 1989. Ashley disappeared, but Michael kept the kids and moved to Florida. Cardi and criminal profiler John Philpin began looking at Michael's presence along the Connecticut River Valley during the time of the murders. Michael was a former Army helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War. While he was in the Army, he earned two Purple Hearts, two Silver Stars, and two Bronze Stars. Despite being decorated so, his military career took a sharp turn for the worse in 1970 when he and seven comrades were charged with strafing civilians during a reconnaissance mission in the Mekong Delta. Strafing is the military practice of attacking ground targets from a low-flying aircraft using mounted automatic weapons. In addition to this, other members of his platoon claimed that Michael had abandoned camp to seek out hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy several times. He took only a knife and he told his comrades that he was going hunting for humans. In regards to the strafing, he was charged with murder and attempted murder, serious charges, but they were eventually dropped for insufficient evidence after six months. He was sent home disgraced. 
When he got back home to America, he showed signs of post-traumatic stress disorder, having nightmares, flashbacks, and angry outbursts. He received psychiatric treatment from the Department of Veterans Affairs for his issues. Even so, he grew bitter towards the government for turning their backs on him and releasing him from duty. He sued the U.S. Army for being discharged and lost. Michael settled in Virginia and opened a sex shop called The Pleasure Chest. The store was raided twice. He and his business partner were charged with selling obscene materials. The first time they were convicted, the second time the case was declared a mistrial. In an interview with The Progress, Michael said, Evidently the police don't have enough serious robberies, murders, and rapes to occupy their time. There in Virginia, Michael met Michelle Ashley. They merged soon afterwards and moved to Holyoke, Massachusetts, and started a family. Michelle already had a child from a previous relationship, and she and Michael went on to have two children of their own. Michelle's family said they didn't care for Michael, saying he was strange. As with any other married couple, Michael and Michelle's marriage had problems. Their marriage became strained. This led to Michelle fleeing with her children. She left her child that she had from her previous relationship with this father and took the two she had with Michael with her. Michael was furious about this and harassed several of Michelle's relatives demanding to know of her whereabouts. She eventually had a change of heart and went back to him. Michelle had told her mother that she was afraid that he would kill her, and if this happened, her mother should find him and rescue the children. Michelle vanished a few months later after her sister's wedding in November 1988. After her mother hadn't heard from her in, a week, in weeks, she drove to Michelle and Michael's home. She walked in and found the apartment abandoned. The Christmas tree had been set up with presents placed underneath, the children's baby books had been left behind. The refrigerator reeked of spoiled food and several items she felt that Michelle would use daily were left lying around. There were no signs of Michelle, Michael, or the children. Michelle's mother waited for her daughter and grandchildren to return, but they never did. Neither did Michael. Michelle's family filed a missing persons report. In 2001, a neighbor of Michelle's family asked his daughter, Leah Marie Cardi, who is a private investigator, to look into the missing family. She took on a case pro bono. Cardi discovered that after Michelle's disappearance, Michael traveled to various states, including Florida and Virginia, where his mother and brother lived. He sometimes had the children with him, and sometimes he left them in the care of relatives or friends. He told some people that Michelle had run away with the drug dealer and others that she was deceased. By this time, Michael was living in Georgia. Cardi found the number for him and called, asking him about his missing wife. He started off denying that he ever knew her. Then he changed his story, saying that he heard she had ran off with a Colombian drug dealer. He called his missing wife a slut who was more interested in drugs than him. He also claimed that she abandoned their children. After Cardi made contact with him, Michael fled his home with his new wife, Eileen Nicolau, after Cardi told him she was going to give Michelle's mother, mother's number, his number. Eileen was his third wife. Allegedly, Michael ran her over with his car during an argument in November 2005. Eileen went back to Florida to recover from the attack. She suffered from a broken shoulder and was recuperating in her sister's home in West Tampa, Florida, when Michael found her Saturday, December 31st, 2005. Her sister called the police and met them in the driveway, telling them that her brother-in-law was in the house with her sister and niece. The police attempted to enter the home, but Michael came at them with a long-barreled weapon, and they retreated. They were able to get Eileen's sister to safety, but sadly were unable to save Eileen and her daughter. He killed his wife in the home and shot his adult stepdaughter too. The police closed in on him again and Michael fatally shot himself. His stepdaughter was taken to the hospital but succumbed to her wounds. Eileen was 45 and her daughter had been 20 years of age. 
After Michael's death, authorities announced they consider him a suspect or a person of interest in a number of hot, heinous crimes, included a series of rape homicides in the Connecticut River Valley. Cardi dug more into his life and discovered that he lived in the area where the Connecticut River killings happened. Another interesting fact to take note of is that half of the victims were nurses, the same as his missing wife, Michelle. The most astonishing fact of all was that Michael had owned a Jeep Wagoner, along with him resembling the composite sketches of the suspect the police were looking for. Michael's other list of potential crimes are the Colonial Parkway killings, Route 29 stalker, the Blue Ridge Parkway rapist, and the murder, murders of Julianne Williams and Lolly Winans on the Appalachian Trail in the Shenandoah National Park. Suspect number two is 46-year-old Gary Westover. In October of 1997, Gary, a paraplegic who had been paralyzed in a diving accident, which left him with partial use of one arm, told his uncle, a retired sheriff's deputy, Howard Menon, a frightening story. Gary felt as if he wasn't going to make it to winter. He was dying. It was time for a confession. He said that in 1987, he and three of his friends had gone out for a night of partying in Vermont. They loaded his wheelchair into a van. They'd been drinking before they abducted and butchered Barbara Agnew. Her body was left in the snow on a back road. Gary's uncle wrote the names of the other three men on a scrap, on a scrap of paper and contacted the authorities. The authorities didn't take him seriously and no arrests were made. If the police acted on the information, they never told Gary. I mean, they never told. Gary died in March of 1988. His uncle died in 2006. This deathbed confession caused some stirs in the case. No one took it seriously when he first confessed, but now with renewed interest in the slayings, this could be the evidence they need for a major break in the case. The third suspect, Delbert Tallman, previously lived in Vermont and New Hampshire. On May 20th, 1984, 16-year-old Heidi Martin was out jogging in Heartland, Vermont when she was found raped and stabbed the next day in a swamp behind the Heartland Elementary School. Delbert, who was 21 at the time, confessed and was put on trial where he recanted and was acquitted. Police began to look at him as a suspect when Barbara Agnew's body was found only a mile away from where Heidi's was located. In 1996, he was convicted of two counts of lewd, mischievous co conduct with a child. When he was released, he moved to Florida and was arrested for failing to register with the sex offender registry. This leaves the question that if he did kill Heidi Martin, like he confessed to, could he have also been one of the men that went out with Gary the night Barbara Agnew was killed? Was his name one of the names Gary Westover gave his uncle? Other possible victims. June 11, 1968, Joanne Dunham was sexually assaulted and strangled in Charleston, New Hampshire. October 5, 1982, Sylvia Gray's body was found stabbed and bludgeoned to death in a wooded area of Plainfield, New Hampshire. She had been reported missing the day before. September 19, 1986, Sarah Hunter's car was found abandoned at a gas station on Route 7A. Her remains will be found two months later at the edge of a cornfield in Paulette, Vermont. She had been strangled. June 20th, 1986, Stephen Hill was last seen picking up his paycheck in Lebanon, New Hampshire. His remains were found on July 15 with multiple stab wounds. They were located in Hartland, Vermont, across the river from where Sylvia Gray's body was discovered four years before. July 25th, 1989, Carrie Moss left her home in New Boston, New Hampshire to visit friends in Golfstown and disappeared. Two years later, on July 24th, 1991, her skeletal remains were found in New Boston. A cause of death could not be determined because of the condition of the body. As for Connecticut River killing victims Jane Borowski and Michelle Ashley, if anyone has information on these cases, please contact your local police and or the FBI so that the families of these victims can get some justice. As with all of my other videos, all of this is alleged. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.